My name is Wayne De Wet. Uh, it's my American nickname for those of you who are here the first time. Some of you already know me, so my apologies if I you know, sound repetitive. Um, but my Afrikaans name is Wijnand. Um, and uh, that is my wife over there, uh, Sumeri. And, um, and we've been in the States now 15 years. So we are both from the country of South Africa. Um, and um, you know, we, we both grew up there and uh, both um, come from families that, that are you know, incredibly serious about their faith. But um, I went on and became a pastor and my wife became an accountant. Our children were born in South Africa and uh, we moved to the States um, at the end of 2008. So we arrived here on a very cold December, um, winter's day, December 16 of 2008. And so we've been here just at that over 15 years now. Um, kids are now in college and uh, all that stuff. So we are empty nesters. Uh, and um, and uh, 10 years or so ago, um, I started One Plus God Ministries and we uh, do mission trips and retreats and teaching and this is part of the teaching portion of that. And so if you look at your lesson on the last page, and, um, so I'll, I'll take a minute to share this with you and then I don't have to do it every time. So literally on the last page you'll see there's some opportunities. If you would go to the website oneplusgod.org, you'll see that there's actually some spots left open for trips that we have this upcoming summer. Um, so Sarah is leading a trip to South Africa. She's leading a trip um, for Dayspring Youth as well to Jamaica. Um, I'm leading one to Thailand. Uh, Sumer is actually joining me on that one this year. and There's some spots open for that. And then we're doing another one with Brother Dean. Can you wave Brother Dean? Brother Dean there in the middle. Him and I are taking a group of Dayspring to Nicaragua. There's three spots left for that one, by the way. So that one is almost full up. And there's a men's conference that um, I'm meeting with some other pastors um, on March 2nd. And so you can still register for that. That's in the Wapakanera, Waynesfield area in a, in a rest, rest, re, restored barn there. Really nice setting. Um, and there's, uh, there's some of you who've asked if there's other men going that direction. So perhaps you can carpool. And if you are going to that March 2nd event, uh, men's event, can you just raise your hand, guys? So uh, Mark Shove is actually on the board with One Plus Card. So I think Blake was wondering. So Blake, there's Mark Shove if you wanna if you wanna hit a ride. So uh, Mark is on the on the board with One Plus Card. So that's awesome. Thank you, Mark. Um, and so if there's some others, you can talk with Mark about that. That's March second. Um, we we have a retreat for um, business people. There's a spot for five couples left for that. So if you a business owner or something like that, we'd love to have you. Um, uh, my wife and I have been leading tours to Israel for a long, long time. Of course, right now we need to pray for Israel. They're going through a difficult time. We hope to be able to resume tours there. And the next one that we're planning will be September of 2025. So September of 2025, it would be awesome if you could join me and my wife. Um, uh, anyone who had gone with us to Israel before, can you raise your hands quickly? So there you go. If you want to know what that is like, you know, please speak with uh, any of, of, of the, those folks. Um, and then uh, we have some global mission volunteer opportunities as well. So if you're interested in any of that, please have a word with um, Sarah. If you want to help out with grant writing or teaching English online or on site, something like that, um, there's the contact cards. We'd love um, for you to, to give your information, bank account numbers, all of those things will be really appreciated. <laughs> I'm just joking. Um, we will send a newsletter to you um, once a quarter or so. And if you are serious about prayer, can you raise your hand, please? Cindy, Cindy, show there in the middle. She's our prayer coordinator and she sends a prayer letter out for the ministry once a month um, and um, so you don't you don't get automatically on the prayer list you have to um, tick the box um, or give your email address to Cindy because we want to know that you are really serious about prayer you still have time in your prayer commitment and that you're actively would like to pray for the ministry so that's what that is about um, so since November I think 
I've been attached to Dayspring Church in a more formal way, uh, part-time helping with their global missions um, and, uh, and teaching. And so, hence, you are here. And so, thank you so much for Dayspring making this room available. And the teachings will also, if you miss one, the teachings will also be, because what I say here and what you have in your notes might be different. Um, not contradictory, but in addition. <laughs> um, and so, um, so if you miss a session, then you can catch it on the um, on the Dayspring Wesleyan Facebook page. It will be posted there as well. Um, with that being said, the notes um, is simply notes that I wrote, and you can um, you know you can use it to to write on those pages. There's some lines and so on. If you, if you just want to listen and follow along in God's Word and just write down, Sarah has some um, journals back there that are just a book with open pages. So if, if there's any one of you that would rather just like to do that, you can just quickly raise your hand and Sarah will come and, and bring one to you or you, know, or you can go over there and get one from her. Is there anyone that, that would just like a book of blank pages and to write? You're all good? Okay, there you go. So, um, Amy back there, there you go. Um, and then, um, so I'm not going to follow that. I'm, I've been long enough in America to realize um, um, your generation, I'm not sure about the kids in school right now, but your generation can all read. So that's fantastic news. <laughs> um, it's scary what you can find out about a country in 15 years. So, um, so, so all of you here, I'm, I'm pretty sure you can read. And so you can read the notes and I don't have to read that for you. Um, I'm just going to share as I go along. And, um, and, uh, and then um, you can uh, you know, make some notes and, and, and enjoy that. So hopefully by now, you're a little bit used to my, my funny, weird accent. Um, we grow up with English as a second language, which is not my first language for those of you who don't know. So if I stumble somewhere around over a word or the accent sounds different, it's simply because we grow up learning more British English than, than, American, uh, than American English. So I apologize for that, but hopefully over time you'll, you'll get a, bit, a little bit uh, used to my accent. People ask, have you walked with lions and rode on elephants? And, Ostriches and uh, stuff like that. Of course, we've done all of that. So I'm serious. <laughs> We're from Africa. So people ask me, are you certain that God called you to America? Did you not come here for the American dream? And my answer is very simple. Why on earth would you leave ostriches and uh, lions and the African sun and come to a place where it snows? I mean, that's crazy. <laughs> who, who on earth will do that? Um, and, um, and then I pray to God that I didn't hear him wrong, you know, because with our accent, um, you know, a, a wire, wire sounds very similar, you know, so I pray to God that I didn't misunderstand and get one day to heaven and go like, God, why on earth did you call me to a place where it snows? And he says, Wayne, what do you mean? And I'm like, you know, God, it snowed in Ohio. And God goes like, Wayne, I never told you to go to Ohio. I told you to go to Hawaii. You know, so it's like, <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not sure if I got it right, but uh, for now I'm here until God calls us uh, to a different place. So um, we, we, we started this journey with Paul um, in the sometime end of last year, and we uh, did Romans, and, and I believe the Roman study is probably also still online available. Um, and if you need the printouts, I'm sure Melissa can help you with that too, if you would want to catch up on that. But we started with Romans, and, um, and so we're into 1 Corinthians now, and a little bit later, sometime in April, we'll do 2 Corinthians, and, and we'll, we'll take it from there and, and see, see, see what's next. So um, when, we, when we look at, um, at 1 Corinthians, there's this... There's this incredible, incredible word there, and it's it's the word called. Um, now, Sarah, can you just come up here quickly? You know, if, if you don't mind. So, um, so the word the word called is um, is there. Yeah. Oh, somebody says I need to turn this or whatever. I won't write too much, but sometimes it helps. Can most of you see something like that? Okay. Um, so, um, 
And uh, so it starts off with um, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 1, right? It's literally the second word that you read there. Um, Paul calls, um, so you can have your Bible. Uh, I think there's Wi-Fi here, right, uh, Melissa? So you can go to the guest Wi-Fi and you just need to click in um, your login. If you, there's no password, I think. Um, if, you, um, if you don't have a physical Bible and you want to get it on, on an app. So otherwise you can open up your Bible in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 1. Um, uh, Paul called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes. So Paul has been called. Um, and then we read in uh, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 9. So that is really, really an important verse. Um, there we read again that um, God who has called you, God who has, there you find it again, God who has called you into, um, into fellowship. So that's a really, really important word. That is the most important word literally in the entire 1 Corinthians. God who has called you into fellowship. And the Greek word there that's being used is one that you might have heard sometime before. Um, in um, your, your journey with Bible studies or whatever, God has called you into koinonia, okay? And so um, that word koinonia, if you would translate that, the far better translation would be partnership. Partnership. Um, and so that's something far more heavy than fellowship, right? And, um, and by now you're wondering why on earth did Wayne call um, Sarah here and just make her stand there, right? Like, uh, <laughs> by now she knows I do that. Um, but there is, uh, you know, what, what are you all wondering? Why did he call Sarah to the front, right? And just makes her stand there and ignores her and just go on. Do you agree with me? There is something, thank you so much, Sarah. <laughs> there, there is, <laughs> I know I can do that with her. If I do that with you, you won't come again. <laughs> I want you to come back. Um, <laughs> next time you might understand my accent, so you know. <laughs> so the, um, there is something extremely powerful about the word to be called. There's something intentional about it, right? You don't call somebody to the front. And then just ignore him. That's just plain rude. You know, it's like, well, why are you doing that, right? Only a stupid African that would do that. So, um, so if you if if you are being called to something, it means you are expecting to hear why have you been called, right? What is the idea? What's the purpose? What's the meaning? You know, what's what's the whole idea? Why am I being called? You know, either I'm in trouble or you did something great or you need to be used as an example or you need to go and do something or whatever, but you're, you're expecting a follow-up thing after being called. You don't just be called and then you just stand there and wonder what is happening. It's just awkward, weird, rude, whatever. Um, and so when it, it's, you know, we read these words, right? So one of the things that I just want to, emphasize again and again if we read God's word we need to read it slowly it's a one book that you don't have to speed read okay so so speed read your novel your sci-fi novel right or speed read the messages of certain presidents or something like that <laughs> but you, you don't speed read God's word you read it slowly and the slower you read it the more you will realize just how powerful it is we read two words Paul called right Paul who was called <laughs> and so then when, when we read in verse 9 that God who has called you I don't know about you but that's a powerful thing for me because who is not excited about Paul that's why you are here right I'm pretty sure you're not here because you're excited to listen to some weird African. You, you are here because you are excited about what Paul wrote down in God's Word, right? It's like, oh my goodness, you know, who doesn't lo love the life story of Paul who was used by God in an incredible way? And you go like, man, Paul was called. Of course Paul was called, right? Look at God did a great job, right? Paul was called. That's amazing. I'm ready to read about this. 
But then to read just, you know, a little bit further, you're not even out of chapter one yet, that you were, were called just as Paul was called. That is huge. Let that sink in for a minute. You walked in here excited to learn about Paul. God says, I am calling you too. And don't let the devil steal that away from you. Oh, you know, well, perhaps that's for Wayne or, you know, Melissa or, you know, people serving in the church or whatever. And, you know, or perhaps that's for the rich person in the room or one with all the qualifications or whatever. I'm not sure if it's for me. It's absolutely also meant for you. It's in God's word. So please believe that. That God, who has called you, and then you go like, why? Why is he calling me? To call me out of my sin? To call me out on, you know, how, all the stuff that I've neglected to do that I should have done? Um, what does what he, he have in mind for me? And what he has in mind for you is to be in partnership, to be in fellowship. The, and, and I'm not saying fellowship is a bad translation, but... Um, there's a better translation for our day and time. What do I mean with that? I mean that, um, you know, people go like, well, oh, look at my Bible. My Bible said partnership like Wayne said. So I guess my Bible translation is for better translation. It's not about that. Language is a living thing. And, and over time, words and the meaning of that word shifts. Fellowship a long, long time ago, meant, you know, that you really are together with somebody, you journey with somebody, and, you know, and you are, you are tight. In our day and time, fellowship doesn't have that meaning anymore. Not necessarily. Not always. You know, you'll, 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 you'll have a, a tea or a coffee or a pop or whatever you want with somebody, you know, or you do a weird thing where you eat pizza together. Who does that? <laughs> you know, and you walk away from there and you go like, man, we had some great fellowship today. It, it doesn't mean that you are now tight. It doesn't mean that you're going to text each other or call each other necessarily all the time. It doesn't even mean that you you'll get together again until whatever the next family or friend event is, right? It's, you've rubbed shoulders a little bit, you had some tea at church together, and you go like, man, we had some great fellowship today. You, you don't necessarily know everything about that person, you, you, you're not necessarily doing life together, it's just you had a good time with each other. That's mostly what the word means nowadays. Would you agree with me? But yeah, m most of the time, right? So partnership, though, means something completely different. If, if I tell you, hey, I want you to go and start a business, you know, here's, I don't know, I don't have that, but here's a, please don't come and ask me afterwards, but here's a million dollars for you, <laughs> go and start a business. Um, you know, I do have a, another African friend, his name is Elon Musk, you know, so he might be like <laughs> So here's a million dollars, go and start a business and find three partners to do this business with. How serious will you consider who are these, these three people that you need to go into a business partnership with? How serious will you consider that? Pretty serious, right? Because a partnership means like we are, we are all in together, you know, we pull our resources, our money, our time, we're in this, right? And we are going to make this work, and if it doesn't work, we might lose a million dollars, you know, and Wayne might not have another million dollars to help us out. So, um, so you need to take that seriously. Another example of a serious partnership, which is absolutely what Paul also had in mind here, is a, is a wedding. Would you agree? A marriage. That's a serious partnership. Before you marry somebody, you know, um, um, uh, my daughter just got married and um, her husband now wanted to ask me the big question and I knew that he wanted to ask me, you know, and so my daughter said uh, to me, you know, that he wants to ask me a question. I said, sure, you know, I said, you better make an appointment at Smith & Bolensky in um, Easton. Do you know the restaurant? 
super expensive steak restaurant, okay, because I'm a steak and meat and potato guy, I'm from Africa. So, um, like, um, uh, you know, and so he, he makes an appointment, and uh, I, I say to Sumeri and my daughter, you know, we will have dessert with you guys afterwards. So after an hour, my wife thinks you, are you still busy? Sure. After two hours, are you still busy? Yep. After three hours, like, this is becoming ridiculous. When are you coming? Like, I'm still busy. Uh, after three hours of very, very serious conversation and enjoying my steak. And I'm not kidding. After three hours of very intense conversation, after I've known this young man for quite a while, but after three hours, I said, okay, I am now happy. I know you have a burning question, brother. What is the question? And he asked, and I said, yes. Why? Because we had a three-hour conversation mm -hmm. where I drooled the dude <laughs> until I knew him better than I think he knows himself. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, I think this can work. If it cannot work, it will not be good for him or for my daughter. Do you agree? So as I care about my daughter, I also need to care about my neighbor. Who is who? Who is the one crossing our path? And so it's like, I want to make sure he doesn't ruin my daughter's life and I want to make sure he doesn't ruin your life. Because I need to care about you just as much. Love your neighbor as yourself. And so this is a serious thing. Paul has something else in mind. In fact, the Greek translation for the word, uh, uh, the Hebrew, sorry, the Hebrew of the word koinonia is a word called um, uh, Kavod, which means covenant. Covenant. And you can imagine that he would have the example of covenant in mind because what was Paul's Bible? It was the Old Testament, would you agree? The Old Testament. So Paul has the Old Testament in mind, and what is the one of the core themes of the Old Testament? God starts what with us? A covenant. He says, I want to come to you, Abram, and I want to be your God, and I want you to be my people. He starts a covenant. So God says, I'm going to be all in. I want you to be all in. I will require certain things from you, and, 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 and you can expect certain things from me. And then God says, this will be a what kind of a covenant? Can you remember? A lasting covenant covenant. And that is why Paul says in Romans that we covered in the last session, to refresh your memory, he says, if you are a child of God, if you have received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you are now also a child of Abram. And therefore the covenant that started with Abram continues with you and me Today, that's mind-blowing. And so Paul says, in a different way, I need you to get it, that this incredible thing where God came to Abram and said, I want to be your God, you need to be my people, and we are going to be in this, and this is our lasting thing, actually also applies to who? To you. And so when People ask me, and I've said that here at Day Spring with the little intro thing that we had. So let me just quickly repeat it for those of you who could not be here because you're not all from this church. But it's a mind blowing thing for me, and that's why I say 1 Corinthians 1 verse 9 is my favorite verse in the Bible because it blows my mind that the God of this universe will come and say, Wayne, I want to be in a partnership. A covenantal, serious, intense, lasting, dynamic kind of relationship, partnership with you. And it blows my mind and I'm like, God, you could have done so much better. <laughs> Why on earth would you choose some coal miner's kid from Africa to be in a partnership with? So I don't know who you are and from what walk of life you come. But what I do know is that God comes to you and says, no matter who you are, I've created you, 
I've died for you, and you are worthy enough, worthy enough to say to you, I want to enter you into a partnership with me. In fact, he says a partnership, yeah, that deserves an amen for sure. A partnership, what does he say? With his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And if you wonder if this partnership can last, it absolutely can, because God says at the end there, he says, I am what? I am? I am faithful. I am faithful. So God says, I am going to be the one making certain that this partnership will last, which is important because if you are like I am, then, you know, you might also not be perfect. I don't know. Yeah. But so if you also stumble like I do sometimes, fail like I do sometimes, unfaithful like I am sometimes, God says the partnership will not fall apart. Because I am the faithful one, making sure that I did not only start a journey with you, but I sustain the journey, and I will see it through to the end, and the end will be never coming. Because where I am at, time does not end. And it will be ever going. That's what God has in mind for you. And I'm telling you, that is special. And let me just quickly take you back, because these eight verses is incredibly important. I really think we can describe it like a foyer of a house. Um, verse 9 is what's called in the Greek um, literature set up. It's called a nexus verse. I don't know if you'll be able to see this. Let's try this. Um, yep, yes. this one, uh, usually these orange ones, so they <laughs> don't work. So it is called a nexus. A nexus verse. A nexus verse means in the Greek literature, it, it means like the hinges of a door. Okay, so verse 9 is incredibly important. Um, so, in other words, if you can figure out in a letter, in a Greek letter, what verse is the nexus verse, it helps you to figure out what is the main theme in that specific letter. In 1 Corinthians, verse 9 is the nexus verse. It's the verse connecting what is before with what, what comes. So if you would imagine, I shared this example um, at, at Day Spring 2 that morning, so forgive me if you hear it twice now, but if, you, if I would invite you over to coffee to our house and you walk into our house, you know, what do you find? You see a dead animal hanging on the wall, and, and of course I've been a stuffed one, okay, so it's, I didn't shoot it like last week, that would be weird. Um, and, um, and, and there's a hide, you know, there's an animal hide, and, and, and there's, um, you know, wooden carved giraffes, and there's ostrich eggs, and whatever, all of that in our foyer, so, you know, so you go like, Note to myself, never go to the debate's house. That's just like <laughs> creepy. Um, and, and, and so what do you expect? You know, so when you walk into the house, you feel something of Africa, right? So, so therefore, you should not be surprised if you go down to the basement and there's five more dead animals against the wall. And there's zebra hide on the floor. And you go into our living room and you sit there and the pillow is made of some animal skin. You know, and you're like, oh my goodness gracious, what is happening to me right now? And then you eat the food and you realize you're not getting your favorite pizza. You're getting something else. And, and you realize, so, so every room that you walk into, you discover something more of Africa. And the foyer of our house, the entrance of the house, kind of prepared you for that. Okay? So this is what's happening here. The first eight verses kind of prepare you as the door of partnership swings open to what will you find in the rest of the rooms. So therefore, don't be surprised if partnership, if koinonia plays a role in the remainder of 1 Corinthians. That's what Paul is trying to say. He says, there's a whole lot of stuff that I need to talk with you about because, man, the church in Corinth had some issues. So, and so I'm not surprised if the church in America has some issues. 
It's just part of the nature of a church. There is no perfect church. Churches have issues. And so Paul says, you have issues. And what I'm going to use to help you to address these issues, to, to do better, to figure things out as you do life together in this church in Carver, I'm going to use partnership to help you to figure this out. And this partnership that you are being called into, you are being called into this partnership by God. And you go like, okay, Wayne, I get that, you know, I know about God. I've got that down. Can we please move on? No. Can we please not? Because I want you to really get it. Who is the one calling you? Okay? So, so, let's just revisit that for a second. Because Paul says, I'm pretty sure Paul goes like, of course, the, the church in Corinth knew who God was. But Paul felt it necessary to remind them of that again. And so let me just remind you of that again. Is that okay? Because this is pretty cool. He says in verse 4, I always thank God for you because of His grace given you in Christ Jesus. That's the first thing. He says, please remember the God that's calling you into this partnership is the God that gave you grace. And if it was not for that grace, you'd be stuck in the world and therefore you'd be useless for God. God cannot use you. God cannot call you into nothing. You know, you are stuck in the world. You're in the claws of evil. And so God says the first thing that you need to remember is me who called you is the one who acted before you could act. Before you could deserve anything, before you could claw yourself out of the mud pool of sin, before you could do anything, I did something. The one who called you is the one who gave grace to you in his son Jesus Christ. Casting grace, right? Listen to verse 5. For in him you've been enriched in every way. Like cheese. If you go and check my bank account, right? <laughs> no, no, no. In every spiritual way. God says, I have enriched you in all your speaking and in all your knowledge. Isn't that amazing? So God says, the one who is calling you is the one who is changing your what? Your, your mind. Because what comes from that? Knowledge. What comes from that? The way that you speak. Somebody in this community, you know, um, Pastor Chuck Tolby died on a sport field uh, while the child was present there in this past week. You know, and you go like, what do I say to that child? that just lost his dad. What can I come up to say to him? And God says, let me remind you that the one who's calling you, he's the one giving you the words. So but when you need to speak into that situation, you might walk up to that person and you're clueless. You might walk up to that person and you don't know what to say, but the knowledge is to say nothing. But knowledge is to just be there. Because where you are at, when you're in this partnership, Christ is at. And you're bringing the presence of God that brings the peace and the understanding that you cannot put in words. But the knowledge is, now is the time to speak, now is not the time to speak. When I need to speak, this is what I need to speak. How I need to act in this situation where I was wronged. This is the knowledge of how to act. God says, everything that you need to say of the knowledge in what to do, I am the one giving that to you. This is the one that's calling you. The next portion of this incredible verse 6. Because our testimony about Christ was confirmed in you. Make that sink in a little bit. That's a little bit different. Because our testimony about Christ was confirmed in you. God says, you need to hear 
that the one that called you and gave grace to you is truly also the one that saved you. You think somebody at some point shared a testimony with you and you might go like, man, I am so glad on that day I chose right. I chose God, you know, and I said, you know, I want to be a child of God. Paul says, you need to realize that God had way more to do with the day when you accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior than what you think. You think it was you who said yes? God says, you confirmed the testimony that came to you because of Christ. Because our testimony about Christ was confirmed in you. Why do we give thanks to God? We give thanks to God because our testimony that came to you about Christ was confirmed in you by who? By God. It blows your mind. And we don't see it always right there when we accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. But when you're in the journey a little while with God and you realize how God has come through for you in so many different ways, do you agree with me? At some point it's like, what was my part in all of this? And you go like, uh, that tiny little part there that I now need a microscope to see? Because God's part was so much more, right? So then in the beginning it might feel to you like your part was huge. And God says, no, 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 no. When the word came to you, and when you accepted it, do you remember the parable of the seed that falls, you know, along the road, and some with the weeds, and some with the rocks, and whatever, and whatever? The weeds could have come and killed what God started in you. It had to be confirmed by God to actually stick. So even though you said, God, I choose you, it could have all gone away with the weeds and the wind and all the stuff and evil and temptation could have, could have killed it all. But it stuck because of who? God. Because of God who confirmed the testimony that you heard. Isn't that amazing? So yes, you did have to choose. Yes, you did say yes. But that testimony, that moment was confirmed by God. That's the God that has called you. Isn't that incredible? And so therefore, verse 7, because God confirmed this, because it started to grow, therefore you do not lack any spiritual gift. As you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. Remember, remember, you do not lack any spiritual gift. Um, you are super special. For heaven's sake, you're not that special. Well, let me just quickly bring you down to earth a little bit as well. Um, so before you think you're a little angel and fly out of here. You know, um, <laughs> he's speaking to who? He's speaking to the church so the you here is not a singular you you have all the spiritual gifts Wayne you have all the spiritual gifts you know um, even your mothering board doesn't have all the spiritual gifts <laughs> so you do not have all the spiritual gifts you who you plural you the church the letter is written to Corinth the church Paul says who is this God that is calling you, you, and you, and you. Everyone in the church has been called, by the way. You are special, you're not that special. You're not the only one in the church that's been called. Okay? You all, that's in the body of Christ, you all are being called, including you individually. And that is indeed special. But we are together. We are in what? Paul is gearing up. Do you hear that? Paul is gearing up. To present what to you? To present this thought to you. He's on his way to verse 9. 
He's on his way to the door. You see a dead animal on the wall. You see the deer skin there. You go like, oh my goodness, I think this has something to do with Africa. He's gearing up to help you to understand we all together have what? All the spiritual gifts. Isn't that amazing? If we can just, for heaven's sake, find a way to be together and stick together. Realize that we are special, but we are special together. To be humble enough to realize you individually are special, but the specialness is because of us. Together we have all the spiritual gifts that we need to change this world. We, the church, have all the spiritual gifts that we need to address all of the issues in our community, in our homes. Isn't that mind-blowing? That's the God that is calling you to be in a partnership with Him. He says, I'm going, I'm calling you into something that is so incredibly special. You won't have to leave that to find what you need to function. You need prayer, you'll find it here. Don't have to go to the world. Don't have to go and find a little bell or a candle or a gong. Like, gong! Well, let me go home and run and light my little candle. <sighs> what a beautiful candle. I feel so much compassion now for my husband. I'm not going to kill him anymore. You know, because of my fantastic candle. You need the compassion, you'll find it here. You need peace, you'll find it here. You need joy, you'll find it here. You need teaching, you'll find it here. You need preaching, you'll find it here. You need healing, you'll find it here. People ask me, what will you do when you get, you know, um, diagnosed of cancer? Or will you go to Africa where there's some big rally, where there's some guy, you know, in Nigeria and... You know, thousands of people come in and they pray for them and they get healed. Will you do that? I say, I will not spend a dime. I will not spend a dime. Where will you find it? Here. And if God doesn't want to hear all of your prayers, with a yes when you heal, because He does hear them all. If He hears them no way, He will bear this illness to the grave. Say, God, that's fantastic. Staking potatoes are much closer than what I thought. <coughs> and I'll be okay with that. Because what I need is where? Right here. Because my God says all the spiritual gifts that you need to make this life work is right here. And so he says, this will continue to be so as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus to be revealed and he will keep you strong. God will keep you strong to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God says, I will start this with you will keep you strong, even when you're weak, even when the cancer comes, even when your dad drops dead on the sport field, I will be there for you all the way through to the end, so that you will stand before your Lord and you'll be blameless. That's who I am. That is the one who calls you. So therefore, when you read now, verse 9, God, you're like, ah! I get it! This God that I just read about, He is about to do what? He's about to call you <laughs> into partnership with whom? With His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. It doesn't get better than this, right? And He is faithful. He will see this through. And Paul says, okay, now that you get that, so we needed to spend a little bit more time on this because this is the foyer of the house. This is telling us 
what all you're going to find in the rest of the rooms. And so now we are ready to step into that. By the way, if any of you have questions, you just need to raise your hand, okay? We're going to do this Africa style, not, you know, American style where you prim and proper and, you know, and raise your hand. You just go like, hey, I have a question. Okay, so that'll be fine. So, um, so please just, you know, you have a question, just raise your hand, ask no problem. Um, so he says in verse 10, he says, man, you guys have some issues. You guys have some issues. One of those is... There's division amongst you, in the middle of this thing. So, um, you know, I, uh, I, there's a problem here, guys. I appeal to you, this thing, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another so that there may be no divisions among you. That's what I'm aiming for, no divisions. That you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. However, I got this message from Chloe. We don't know much about Chloe's household, except that Chloe um, informed Paul um, that there are squirrels among the people in the Corinthian church. And so Paul says, let me spell this out to you. There are some of you who says, I follow Paul. Another I follow Apollos. Another I follow Cephas. Still another I follow Christ. He says, there cannot be such divisions in the church, that, that is, not, that is not, not, not a good idea. So the first thing that Paul says, he says, please, guys, there should be no division um, if you are truly in partnership with each other. Can there be any division? Of, of course not. What, what should there be? There should be unity. There should be unity. And so he says, some of you are rallying up around Paul because you go like, man, Paul, he's, he's an amazing leader, right? So I'm, I'm, I love strong leadership. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm all for Paul. Some of you go like, man, I'm, I'm all for Apollos. You can go and read about him more in, in Acts chapter 18, verse 24 to 28. Um, and, and so Apollos was a guy that he really was a great teacher. He knew the Old Testament well. Remember, the New Testament was not written yet. So he is into the scriptures and you go like, man, I love a good teacher. I am going to find a great teacher and I'm rallying around a teacher. You know, so I'm all for this teacher. Another one would say, well, I'm all for Cephas. Cephas was one that knew the traditions and so on really well. We don't know much about Cephas from the Bible, but we know something about him from uh, literature around the Bible. And so if we do have the right Cephas, it seems like he was someone that was all about the traditions. I'm going to find the pastor, the leader that's all about more traditional, you know, and he's going to be or she's going to be my guy. Um, and then, listen to this. Paul says there's even another group, and they say they are, they do what? They follow Christ. And go like, man, that doesn't sound too bad. We need to be a Christ group, right? So let's, you know, let's rally up around that group. And Paul says, all of you are wrong. All of you are wrong. It should be about us in partnership with Jesus Christ. We are the same mind and thought. So one could say, listen carefully, one could say that for Paul, as he addresses the problems in the Corinthian church, one could say that his mindset from which he debates with himself, how can we solve this problem, was partnership. We are in partnership with God. God is in partnership with us. We're in partnership with one another. If that is true, if that's our mindset that we work from, then how are we going to address the problems in the church? So Paul's debate is if we are in unity with God, um, same mind, thought, we're in unity with God, then uh, in partnership with God, then we have to be in unity, right? If, if you are in partnership with God, and you are, and you are, and you are, and you are, then all of us are supposed to be in unity, one, one fault, one mind. 
And so Paul says, that's how it's supposed to be. So please stop this thing where some of you are, you know, more for this and some of you more for teacher and some of you more for let's figure out who's and then some of you more for the Christ group. So Paul is not saying um, that this group is wrong because they follow Christ. They are wrong because they are saying, in other words, what is this group saying? They're saying, we're following Paul, look at us, we're doing it the right way. No, 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 no. The teacher, we are doing it the right way. No, the traditions, we are doing it the right way. So what did the Christ group say? We are doing it the right way. It's not who they're following, what they are saying, how they're doing it. So they're saying, listen guys, we have figured it out. How, how we follow Christ. That's the way that you should do it. So become a part of our group. We are the Christ group. We, we, the way that we do things, that's the way that Christ wants us to do things. Suddenly, it hits really home very quickly. Because isn't it so that we will often say, you know, we feel the way that we do things. You know, that's... That's the Christ way. But then we, from there, it's just one little step to go like that's the best way. In fact, that's the only way. You know, our worship is a way that Christ would like us to worship. So, your way, it's like, yeah, you know. The way that we reach the community, that's a way that Christ wants us to reach the community. So, what are you, what's the next thing? The way that you guys do it, it's like, eh, you know, you're getting there, but not quite. We, we have a Christ group. We don't say it like that, but sometimes we are a hair with the way from living it. And unintentionally actually saying it. And it sounds really good, but it's not how we should be. Paul says... We are all seeking Christ. We all have different spiritual gifts. We all need each other. And the way that you reach your community and the way that I reach my community might not be the same. The question is, are we reaching them? <laughs> the way that you are worshipping, you know, with your guitar and your drums and whatever, and the way that you are worshipping with your organ and these Africans using zero instruments, they are all worshipping. The question is not what is the right way. The question is, is God glorified by it? And if God is glorified by it, we are all in unity. Because that is what we are supposed to do with our worship. We are supposed to glorify God. So the moment you go like, man, I'm glad we don't dress like those guys. You know, Christ would want us to dress neatly. You know, or Christ would want us to be more relaxed so that other people who don't dress so neatly can feel welcomed, you know, or the moment we go there, we are literally the Christ group. And the group that you're like, well, we might be like that or that, but at least we're not like this group. <laughs> I think most of the time we are this group. Isn't that scary? So we need to be so careful is if what we are doing is honoring Christ, then the way in which we are doing it is not destroying our partnership, should not be destroying our partnership, in fact should be strengthening our partnership because the church has all the spiritual blessings that they need, all the speaking and all the knowledge that they need, and therefore there will be diversity, but that doesn't mean that there's not unity. That doesn't mean that there's not unity. Diversity does not mean no unity. Division means there's no unity. That is something completely different. When we start to be in different camps, um, put churches and leaders and so on in different camps, that is a problem. Paul says that should not happen. He speaks about baptism. He says in verse 14, you know, some of you, uh, well, let me read verse 13. He says, is Christ divided? And of course the answer is no. Well, was Paul crucified for you? No. So why are you making it about Paul, right? Um, were, 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 um, were you baptized in the name of Paul? 
Like, man, at least I should follow the one that baptized me. Who baptized the most? Perhaps we should follow that one, you know, because it means that he's getting it right. If he's baptizing more people than other people, I guess he's the one getting it right. Paul goes like, I'm thankful that I did not baptize any of you. And then he goes like, oh, shoot, hang on. No, I did baptize Crispus and Gaius. So, you know, so he's trying to say... I cannot even remember if I baptized any of you, and well, okay, if I think a little bit about it, perhaps I baptize you, and perhaps I, perhaps I baptize you, and you know, so, um, so, 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 so no one, no one can say that you were baptized into my name. That, that, that's not, that's not what it's about. And oh, and then in brackets, oh, sh hang on, hang on, hang on. I also, I guess, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Well, well, uh, besides that, I cannot remember anyone. He's trying to say, please, it is not about the baptism. What is it about? Christ did not send me, verse 17, to baptize. What did Christ send us to do? To, to, to preach the gospel. There are, there are literally some churches that will say, you know, baptism is so high up on the list that it's one, one of the criteria that makes you a super duper member. <laughs> it's like, no, 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 no. Um, you need to remember that baptism is supposed to point you to who? Supposed to point you to? To Christ. And so the moment that you make baptism more important than Christ, something is wrong. It says it's about Christ. If you were not saved in Christ, then you could, could not be baptized anyways. So it says, go forth and make Disciples, not go forth and baptize people. Go forth and make disciples. And then, once they are disciples, how will people know that they are disciples? When, when, when publicly they, they come to a place where God comes, not, not they, where God comes and says, I want to give you a sign now that you belong to me. So it's not about you. Really, you can claim anything? On what grounds? Can you claim a sign from God? On what grounds? What did you do that's so special? So God says, I want to give you my sign so that everybody can know now you have put your faith in me. And who gets the glory? God gets the glory. God gets the glory. And so if you walk away from the baptism and everything is about you, all the big church and all the, all the big celebration afterwards is about you, there's something wrong. It should be about God publicly today acknowledge my faith before the faith community and the world. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. That you were baptized? Uh, I don't know about that. And if we make it about the baptism, then we get stuck in how much water was used and your age and all this stuff. We have, um, we have you know, sketches on the, on the uh, rock walls in Turkey where the early Christians lived. We have Bible texts. Um, Acts 16 has two of those where households were being baptized. We have several explanations all across the ancient world and in the Bible that it was not about the amount of water and your age and all that stuff. It was about Christ. It's about God extending to you a sign that you are acknowledged by Him that you've put your faith in Him. And that's a big deal. It's about God. He says, um, verse 17, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of human wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. You hear that? He says you put the emphasis on baptism, and you literally empty the cross of its power. If it's about you claiming a sign, if it's about you doing something at your baptism, you doing something, like, wow, what just happened there? 
I says, I thought it was about you publicly making it known that I died for you. Christ go like, I would think that in that scenario, the focus should be on me and not on you. And so don't turn that around and go like, well, I'm, I'm following that dude because, you know, he baptized not only me, he's baptizing a hundred people a month, you know, let's run after him. Like, ah, please keep running after Christ. Because if it wasn't for Christ, there would have been no baptism. So let's rather keep running after Christ. The partnership is with Christ. Baptism and all these other things <clears throat> should continue to be about the one that you are in a partnership with. 4 verse 18, the message of the cross, it's all about the cross. It's all about the partnership with the one who hang on the cross. So Paul says, let's circle back and put that where it belongs in the center. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. He says, those people that don't accept Jesus Christ, they think the cross is foolish. In fact, he uses the Jews and the Greeks, the you know, two major people groups of that time, use them as an example. He says in verse 22 of chapter 1, Jews demand miraculous signs. The Jews were, was hoping that they would find in Jesus someone that would, um, you know, uh, come in and be able to lead the Jews to overpower the Romans. That would be a miracle. The, the Jews walk by even when Jesus hang on the cross and what, what do they say? Oh, you saved many, can you? Save yourself. To the very end, they want to see what? They want to see a miracle. They want to see so many miracles in Jesus' life that Jesus says at some point, you know, I'm not going to give you one more miracle. I'm done with all these miracles. They want to see miracle after miracle after miracle. Um, and, uh, and the cross doesn't seem like a miracle. The cross seems like a defeat. It seems like Jesus dies. The cross doesn't seem like a miracle. So they struggle to accept the cross. Middle of verse 22, the Greeks look for wisdom. The Greeks are all about, they were the great philosophers. Things needed to make logically sense. And that's scary. Because in America, I wonder if we talk about faith, I wonder if we talk to Americans or if we talk to Greeks. Because if it doesn't make logically sense, if it, uh, you know, things like, I cannot accept that. It's exactly what the Greeks say. So if, it, if, if this doesn't make logically sense, a great leader cannot be somebody that hangs on a cross. There's no logic in that. It sounds foolish. There's no wisdom in that. You know, I cannot make a philosophy out of that. Follow a dead leader, a God that kills himself for man. What on earth makes sense about that? The Greeks go like, there's no logic in that. This sounds foolish. Listen to your American brothers and sisters, and you will realize how crazy close it is to exactly this. It's like, this is not logical. This doesn't make sense. This sounds foolish. And so they want nothing to do with it. Verse 23, Paul says, we preach Christ, the one that you have been called into partnership with. Who is he? He's the one that's been crucified. It's a stumbling block to the Jews and the foolishness to the Gentiles. Why? Because you can go home and you can read um, Galatians 3.13. So Galatians 3.13, where um, Paul is, um, it's in your notes, with, so you can find the verses there too. Um, where, where Paul says, um, you know, I'm quoting the Old Testament, I'm quoting Deuteronomy, because anyone who hangs on a tree, anyone that hangs on a cross, in other words, there's a high possibility that the cross might even have been just a tree where Jesus was um, nailed to. Um, anyone who hangs on a tree is what? Cursed. And so they, they would say that this is a stumbling block for us. You know, um, if you, why would God say in his word that anyone who hangs on a tree is cursed and then here Jesus hangs on a tree. So for the Jews, it's a stumbling block because God said anyone who hangs on a tree is cursed. How can God curse the Messiah? 
right? So that, that's a stumbling block for them. For the Greeks, it's, it doesn't make sense. This is foolishness. And so both of them lose out on the best message ever because they are stuck looking at it from a worldly point of view. Verse 24, to those whom God has called both Jews and Greeks, Christ is what? Christ is the power of God. Christ is the wisdom of God. The Jews miss that the greatest miracle ever is that Jesus Christ goes into the grave, gives life to himself and comes back out. The greatest miracle of ever is Christ dying and coming back to life. And so they miss that, that it is actually a miracle. And the Greeks miss it, that God's wisdom and our wisdom works differently. In fact, verse 25, the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom. So if you would have a barometer here of here is a super wise thing to say and here is a super foolish thing to say, if God respectfully said, would say something here, then, you know, then it would equate to, to the wisest thing that man could say. So that's what Paul's saying. He says, if you would compare God's barometer, or what is that the right word, of um, foolishness and wisdom, and, and man's barometer, where, where man's top wisdom thing, this is the wisest thing that man has ever said, you are right at the bottom of what 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 God would what God would say, you know. And I don't want to attach an example to that because I don't want to get into trouble with God. That's a bad idea. So, um, whatever the weakest thing, right? So, whatever the weakest thing would be that that God could do, let, let, let's say, you know, um, um, a, a widow's jar doesn't go into a food, and it only serves a few people. Strongest thing would be, you know, um, so this would be weak and this would be strong. The strongest thing would be to feed the entire nation of Egypt, uh, of Israel, as they journey from Egypt to the Holy Land, right? God feeds the whole nation with manna and quail. That, that's a strong thing. It's not just a household. Um, Paul says in end of verse 25, the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. So if you would have a barometer of people here, and this would be the strongest thing that a human can come up with, that is the beginning of God's weakness, respectfully said, up to his strength. So in other words, what is Paul saying? He's saying there's no comparison. The problem is you need Christ to see that. So, um, brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Important thing to remember that. It says many of you were wise by, um, by human standards. Not many were influential. Um, not many were of noble birth. It says think back with what you were when God called you and where you are at today. Right? It says, when you were called, you were, you were nothing. Who was I? Some coal miner's kid in Africa. Not of noble birth, by human standards, a nobody, no influence, nothing. Um, verse 27, but God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. So please don't forget where you were at you know, stuck in addictions, or, you know, um, didn't have a clue about God or His Word, or in terrible relationships, or whatever. Where, where were you at when God called you? And He says, think about where you are at today, um, and see how God has changed you from foolish to wise, from weak to strong. He chose for lowly things, verse 28, of this world, the despised things, things that are not, to nullify the things that are, so that, so that what? No one may boast before him. In fact, end of verse 31 of this chapter, let him who boasts, boast in the law. What is Paul saying? 
if you remember, not who you are today. If you remember who you are today, you might think, I'm a great leader, you should follow me. I'm a great teacher, you should follow me. You know, I have figured out how to follow Christ, you should follow me. Paul says, please remember, before you were called, who you were. If you remember that, then you will also remember today, I need to continue to glorify who? Christ. And therefore, if you walk out of here and you go like, man, I am now a Wayne or a Wayne fan, may God forgive you. Please stop that. Please don't be that. Please leave here and say what I heard tonight is God has called me to be in a partnership with his son, Jesus Christ. And I heard that over and over tonight. And I want to be sold out for Christ. What am I doing? I'm simply using one spiritual gift of the many that we collectively have that I did not deserve, came from nothing to this place, saved by grace, to share this with you so that collectively we can go and do better. So please don't become a Wayne fan, that would be horrible. Be all about the cross. Who brought you from where you were at to where you are at now. And none of us in this room have a reason to boast about anything but our partnership in Christ and with one another. And that's chapter one. Chapter two, Paul is bowling on this. He says, Verse 2, I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And by now you're like, ah, yep, we get it. Thank you, Paul, emphasizing that again. I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling. That's important. I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling. He is now, you know, a changed Paul. He's now living out the... Um, purpose that God had called him to. He is serving, he's planting churches. And he, by the way, he probably did not plant the church in Corinth. One of the other people probably planted the church in Corinth. He's just coming there to help them grow and sending this uh, letter to them. And, um, and so as he gets there, he says, when I came to you, as someone that has already planted churches and taught all over and, you know, and stayed faithful while I was persecuted, I came to you how? I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling. <clears throat> we have to continue to be able to remember who we are in Christ and continue to stay humble while we are that. You are special, you're not that special. You are special as long as you're attached to Christ. So we need to continue to stay humble. You know how many times I prayed over this lesson tonight? You know how many times I have preached and taught this 1 Corinthians? This, by the way, this was my thesis actually, 1 Corinthians. I spent eight years of my life on this. And when I come here, and I see this long line of people, I'm like, can I please go and throw up and run home or do something, <laughs> hide in a big hole? You know, the moment we walk into what God is calling us to do and we go in there thinking how great we are and how fantastic we are, we have failed even before we begun. Paul says you need to remember you're in a partnership that you have been called into. You've done nothing to deserve it. You've been called into that. And so when we walk into whatever, go and share with your child, go and share the good news with your grandchild, um, you know, hop on a plane and go to another country and, you know, do something on a mission trip or whatever, you know, whatever that is that God is calling you into. Um, you need to do that in humbleness. Uh, and then what will people experience? We will experience verse 4, my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's 
power so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom but on God's power. If we think it's our words or how eloquently we speak or how deliciously our English is or whatever, you know, if we think it's the words and how we can manipulate our words and, you know, the presentations or how well we can draw, don't you think I can draw fantastic? You know, if you think it's about that and that is that moves people, you will not get anywhere with anything that you're trying to do. You need to realize just you bringing it in fear and trembling and God steps into that and then people experience something of this power of the Holy Spirit at work. If you, if you listen to any of this in the last hour and you felt the stirring in your heart, then that's the Spirit move. That's what we want. Is that you experience God is laying something on my heart. Wow, dude, I need to work on that. I need to go home and think a little bit more about that. I need to go and pray a little bit more about that. You know, if that is happening to you, then it's the power of the Spirit that is at work. And that's what you want. Whether you're involved with children's ministry at your church or whether you greet people at the door. You think, really? That you're making a difference by greeting people at the door because of how you dress or how well you shake their hands or with whatever cool thing you come up with saying as they walk through the door. You've got to be kidding me. Really? You think that's going to cause someone to come back to this church? I'm sorry you think too much about yourself. But if you have the gift of hospitality and you walk to that door, with fear and trembling. And you go like, somebody might walk through this door today that hasn't walked through the door of the church in a really, really long time. And how I greet them here might move them to come back. Then you realize how badly you need to rely on the partnership that you are at in Jesus Christ. And then, just then, you might pray more about greeting the people at the door than the time that you spent on choosing what you should wear this morning because you are greeting somebody at the door. And what cool thing I could come up to say to somebody. If you do that, then whatever you do and say there will be so spirit inspired that people will experience as they enter the church door what? A demonstration of the Spirit's power. And that, my dear brother and sister, can move somebody to come back. Mm -hmm. The fact that you are, you know, a person that, that, that seems very extrovert, that's why I should greet people at the door, you know, or say cool things, or you can dress nicely. If you think that moves people, you're missing the mark. Can people experience that God's Spirit is at work wherever you are serving. That's what moves people. So, um, continuing into chapter 2, verse 10, he says, God has revealed to us what to do by His Spirit. And who is this Spirit? The Spirit is the one who searches all things. Listen to this, end of verse 10, even the deep things of God. So, this is awesome. So, in other words, when you have been called into partnership with Jesus Christ, our Lord, you might wonder like, well, am I called into partnership with the Holy Spirit as well? And the answer is yes, when? Immediately. Because Father, Son, and Spirit is truly one. Do you really believe that? There's some, some theologies out there that will say, you, you know, you see, you receive Jesus Christ and then at some point you need to go through some sort of, a, you know, special baptism or you need to receive some special gift and, and only then you, you will know that now you also have the Holy Spirit. How, how does that work? So you receive God kind of in portions? Like that's just weird. You know, when I stand in front of you, I'm sorry, but the same dude that stands in front of you is also the one that in just a few minutes are going to be in his pajamas on his couch. And she will not call me professor or teacher or pastor. She'll say, hey, baby, how are you? you know? Like, don't call me babe. 
you know, or uh, Afrikaans word for me will be backy or whatever. I'm like, no, 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 I'm Professor the Bear sitting here. The he goes like, what? You know, go and sleep in the dark house, you know, which we don't have, so I'll have to find one at your house. You know, it's like, I'm just, you, you get all of me. You know, you, you get you get the teacher and the pastor and you know and uh, the, the the you know the husband and the father and just the dude. You know, yeah. You don't get me in portions. Who you see now is just one perspective of me, right? I'm actually just like you guys, just like you. When you receive Jesus Christ, you get all of it. And the other part of this partnership is a partnership with the Spirit. Who is He? Have you forgotten? He is the one that knows the deep things about God. Like, oh my goodness gracious! It doesn't get better. The evening just gets better and better, right? Let's just keep going until 10 o'clock tonight. This is good to start. Um, verse 11. Um, no one knows the thoughts of God except the the Spirit of God, like, wow, we get the thoughts of God. We have not, verse 12, received the Spirit of the world. What have we received? We have received the Spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. If you hear these things, can I just say that? And you go like, I don't know what is happening here. I don't agree with none of this. This doesn't make sense. Can I just kindly and graciously say to you, you need to stay behind. Because then you haven't given your life to Christ yet. Mm -hmm. If you've been sitting here and all the time you listen to all of this and go like, none of this makes sense to me. I don't understand it. It's not because of my delicious African English. It's because you have not surrendered your life to Jesus Christ yet. That's the only reason. The good news is, stay behind and 10 minutes later, it will all start to make sense to you. You need to receive the grace of Jesus Christ. The testimony needs to be confirmed in your life. You need to enter into a partnership with Him. And then, once you have given your life to Christ, you also receive who? The Holy Spirit, who knows the thoughts of God, who can help you to make this digestible so that it become real for you, starts to make sense for you. And so there's nothing magic about it. You don't need to go to seminary or something like that. It's great if you want to and fantastic if you already have. But you can digest it. Why? Because the Spirit of God is with you. You go like, I just never get this stuff. I have to ask you a question. Have you received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior yet? Because only then this will start to make sense. And it's not me saying this. And I'm not trying to make you feel bad. But I also don't want you to go home lost. Eternally lost. The greatest news ever is that you receive Jesus Christ and you also receive the Spirit of God who knows the deepest things about God. And therefore, the deepest things about God start to make sense to you. You're like, oh my goodness, this is amazing. So this is what we speak, verse 13, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, expressing spiritual truths in spiritual words. There's nothing special about the words, it's just things about this, the Spirit of God. So the man, verse 14, without the Spirit, does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God. They are foolishness to you. You cannot understand them. Because you are spiritually discerned. So you go to your job or you speak with your family members that don't know God and you talk with them about, you know, how we should act in this world and how we should make a difference and how we should share our faith and how we should treat, you know, people that are stuck in sin and so on and so on. And, and all they do is, you know, um, uh, cuss you out or say bad things back to you or tell you how stupid you are or whatever. There's nothing wrong with you. The problem is, it's as if you are speaking Afrikaans met hulle. And then I can't get a word to say that you 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 can't get a word
It's as if you're speaking another language. And they simply do not understand what you are saying. Because you are speaking about spiritual things and they just cannot get it. So don't be frustrated with it. Please don't throw him out. That's not what Jesus would do. It's a sign to you that they just don't have what you have and at some point did not have. Please remember in that moment who you were when you were caught the first time. You were just as foolish. You sounded the same. You also didn't get it. You're getting it now. Not because of who you of being so fantastic and not because of who you're following on earth. You're getting it now because of Jesus and because of His Spirit making it possible for you to digest it and even now word it. Because when you get in, you get all of everything that you need, all the knowledge and all the wisdom and all the speaking that you need to speak it. So all it says is they need Christ. And that's not a bad thing when you realize that. That's a great thing because you just sat with a lost sinner and God can use you to help him to find the life that you have. That's a moment to celebrate, not a moment to argue about, not a moment to blow up about. Not a moment to make the other person feel like dirt about. It's supposed to be a glory moment where heaven could open up and grace could come and change that person's life forever. So, um, this, um, where are we at? Um, 14. The man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God. They are foolishness to him. They cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual man makes judgments about all things. But he himself is not subject to man's judgment. For he has known the mind of the Lord. That he may, uh, uh, for, uh, sorry, for who has known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him. But we have the mind of Christ. That's a powerful thought. Let's close with that. And we'll end here. Chapter um, 3 is going back to the whole division thing. I will quickly recap that next time because we actually already covered that. It's kind of like an a, um, a, a expansion of what we found in, in, um, in the beginning, uh, in the middle of, of chapter 1. So let, let's finish with this because this is pretty powerful. The spiritual man makes judgments about all things. What does it mean? It's you. Paul is saying you need to realize that as you live your life, you have this incredible, incredible blessing that you constantly can judge things from a spiritual angle. You can help people who struggle with their marriages because you can tell them how they should look at their marriages from a spiritual viewpoint. You can help people who struggle um, to raise their children because you can judge how to raise kids from a spiritual angle. People get all upset and talk about the politics and say all kinds of weird and bad and whatever things. And you can speak into that moment because you have the ability to bring a spiritual viewpoint on whatever subject matter you are faced with. How about that? You can make judgments about all things. Just let that sink in. That is pretty incredible. And so therefore, it's a sad thing if the opportunity arises to say something and you don't. Because you're afraid you will be judged or, you know, you'll get a bad, you know, um, something, a bad reaction or whatever. The bad reaction that you get is simply helping you to see who's not getting it yet. So that you can help them to get it. So don't be afraid to say what the Spirit leads you to say, because if you don't say it, you have robbed people from the opportunity to hear how, how God wants you to think about what is happening in the world around you. And then he says, 
He himself is not subject to any man's judgment. So as you say this, and somebody goes like, you know, that's how you, that's not how you should think about stuff. You're just some Bible thumping Christian. You think you know everything. Paul says, listen to this. He says, you are, should not be subject to any man's judgment. That person is judging you from a worldly point of view. So don't get upset about it. Don't be surprised about it. Paul says it's going to happen to you. But when it happens, you don't have to get all upset and be, you know, all beat down about it. Again, all it shows you is who is lost, who's not getting it, who's stuck in the foolishness of the world, that who needs help. He says, nobody, nobody, nobody knows the mind of the Lord. Nobody can instruct him. Nobody can say, that's not how you should look at um, homosexuality. That's not how you should look at abortion. That's not how you should look at raising your children. That's not how you should look at, at, um, at, at marriage. Because you are sharing it from the thoughts of God. The spirit that knows the thoughts of God is speaking through you. So nobody knows the mind of Christ to come and instruct him. Because you realize if somebody has a different opinion from you, sharing what the Spirit says through you based upon God's Word, if somebody says, you cannot think about something like that, that's stupid, that's foolish, that's bible thumping thing, whatever, whatever. They are trying to instruct who? God. Paul says nobody can do that. So don't worry about that. Don't get upset about that. Don't get frazzled by that. And listen to this. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Listen carefully, that he might instruct him. I'm almost done. I'm almost done. That man, I'm like, ooh, this is exciting. This is exciting. This is exciting. He is, he is um, referring to the Old Testament, right? To the Old Testament, Yahweh. He's referring to the Lord. He's quoting an Old Testament verse there, right? Are you with me? He's quoting Isaiah 40, verse 13. Isaiah 40 verse 13, no one um, knows the mind of the Lord. So in other words, who? God, the God of the Old Testament, the God who created everything, the God who let Israel, you know, go through the Red Sea dry feet, that, that God, do you remember him? The God who gave us the Ten Commandments, nobody knows his mind. Are you tracking with me? So nobody can instruct him. Are you still with me? If you fell asleep a little bit, please wake up, okay? Because you need to get this. This is going to cause you not to sleep a wink until we see each other again. You're going to float out of here. You're going to drive, you're going to go like, Woo! This is fantastic! What is so fantastic? We. We. You. Are you with me? Have the mind of Christ. Paul does this all the time. Paul loves to show us. So he quotes an Old Testament text pointing to God of the Old Testament, helps us to see Jesus, and he says, Who has known the mind of the Lord? But we do. Because we have the, the mind of Christ. And Paul connects God and Christ and says two amazing things in one. Jesus absolutely also is God. And no one without Christ can know the mind of God. But you are in partnership with Christ, and you know the mind of Christ. Therefore, you're connected to the Spirit. He knows all the deep things about Christ and God, and you know <coughs> the mind of God. If you ask me to teach you what all that means, I do not have a cooking clue. <laughs> all I know is it is mind-blowingly special. And you 
have that. And therefore, when opportunities arise to speak from the mind of Christ into situations in your family and this world, please do not be quiet, but speak the mind of Christ, of God. Father, thank you so much for this time together. Thank you for the power of your spirit at work in this space. And thank you for mind-blowing truths. And thank you that you have changed us by your grace from what we were called to here where we can walk out of here. No, 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 float out of here. With a peace and a joy that we haven't perhaps had for a long time. Hope that we might not have had for a long time. Knowing that we can go back to our battles out there and to dress it from the mind of Christ, of God. You have called your children here into partnership with Christ Jesus, who gives us access to the Spirit, who know your deepest God, may you, who are faithful, go with your children into this week. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.